Welcome to today's live webinar on five ways MQTT spark plug enables smart manufacturing. This webinar is sponsored by Hive MQ and Automation.com, a subsidiary of the International Society of Automation. I'm Jack Smith, Senior Editor of Automation.com, and I will be your host. This webinar is designed for manufacturers looking to modernize their data structure, data infrastructure, and improve their operations using MQTT Sparkplug, a powerful technology that can help unlock data siloed in legacy systems and enable smart manufacturing. MQTT Sparkplug is a specification that defines how to use the MQTT protocol to transport data in real time from industrial IoT devices and sensors to an MQTT broker. This allows for the seamless and reliable transmission of data from large numbers of devices and sensors. Specifically today, you'll hear from our speakers about how to use MQTT spark plug to enable smart manufacturing, unlock data from legacy systems, transmit data in real time from IIoT devices and sensors, and enable real-time monitoring and control of manufacturing processes. Join us to learn how to implement this cutting-edge technology and start seeing results in no time. We'd like this to be an interactive session, and there will be time for questions at the end. So before we get started, please take a moment to acquaint yourself with the features of this GoToWebinar technology. On the right side of your screen, you will see a questions tab. Simply click the text box, enter a question, and click send at any time. All questions will only be seen by me and our speakers. Once the main presentation is over, I will ask our speakers to respond to as many questions as time allows. While keeping this overall presentation time to one hour. This presentation, including the Q&A session, is being recorded and afterward you will be emailed a link for viewing it later. Also within the tabbed menu, you will see a tab specifically for handouts. You can download these materials at any time. In addition, this presentation includes two poll questions. So you and our speakers can learn a little bit about who is in the audience today. And I will give you time to answer each brief question and then show the aggregated results immediately after. Your individual answers remain anonymous to other attendees. So let's take this first question. What are your goals for digital transformation? Please check all that apply. It okay, looks like 71% of you chose factory automation, and the next one down is 55% at reducing costs. And 81% it, um, chose improving operational efficiency. Okay, let's go to our next question. What are the challenges with automation? Please select, select all that apply.
cost, integration and scalability, and lack of flexibility seem to be our top answers. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now let's hear about our speakers. Ravi Subramanian is Director of Industry Solutions Manufacturing for Hive MQ. He is product marketing and management leader with extensive experience in delivering high quality products and services that have generated revenues and cost savings of more than $10 billion for companies such as Motorola, GE, Bosch, Weir, and Parker Hannafin. His expertise spans industries such as mining, oil and gas, industrial automation, automotive, mobile devices, enterprise communications, automotive, fleet management, and industrial motion management. He is an expert in industrial IIoT, Industry 4.0, data analytics, artificial intelligence, big data, data security, cloud platforms, SAAS, PAAS, and Agile methodologies. At Hive Q, Ravi is in charge of evangelizing, enabling sales of the Hive MQ solution among manufacturing and industrial automation customers. Kudzai Mende Teresa is developer of advocate at is developer advocate at Hive MQ and the founder of Industry 4.0.tv. He is extensively involved in research and communication around Industry 4.0 and AI for smart manufacturing topics offering a unique perspective on the latest developments and trends in these fields. He shares his insights and knowledge with uh, a dedicated audience of solution architects and developers through his popular YouTube channel and IIoT podcast, Industry4o.tv. And we're eager what they have to say, so now I will turn the mic over to Ravi. Thank you, Jack, for that wonderful introduction. Much appreciated. Um, welcome to everyone for this uh, this automation.com webinar on uh, five ways MQTT spark plug can transform businesses, specifically within manufacturing. And thank you, audience, for responding to the poll questions because that's kind of like sets the stage on what we're going to be talking about. And interestingly, for uh, the goals for digital transformation, it looks like operational efficiency was the number one concern in terms of goals. And that's kind of like what we see with a lot of our customers as well. For example, we have a major automotive manufacturing customer in the US that uh, specifically came to us because they were having issues with um, ensuring that they are able to operate efficiently across all of their factories all across the world, for example, right? And they needed some, some way to bring in all the information together on their factory operations and have create a single pane of glass so that they can actually use that to improve efficiency. And the factories can in some in some way compete against each other to kind of ensure that they are they are right there in terms of operation. Uh, we have uh, another customer that uh, is uh, focused on reliability compliance because they are they are in the pharma industry, pharma manufacturing, which is as you know is highly regulated, especially now with. Uh, with COVID and the ensuing demand for pharma drug manufacturing, there is there is double the doubling down from FDA and other um, compliance organizations on manufacturing because this is kind of a life and death thing. So, like we had a customer that failed the audit and came to us to make sure that they are they don't have this issue going forward. Reducing costs that is something that is always the case because hey, you know who doesn't like to reduce costs and improve their profit margin, right? Factory automation is another big thing. So how can I automate the things that are repeatable tasks, if you, if you will, right? And tasks that are potentially like uh, kind of dangerous in terms of having human beings do. If you can automate that using robots and other methods, then we can focus on things that are more advanced. We can, we can, we can then that allows factories to get to the next level. Business continuity is another big thing for um, customers uh, in, in manufacturing because over over the years as you as you can imagine you have a um, workforce that is retiring right so the baby boomers are retiring and they have all the tribal knowledge of how to run the factory they can listen to a machine and figure out what the issues on those machines are 
but obviously like the, the younger generation that's just coming in don't have that experience so how can you take the expertise that the, the folks that are retiring have in their minds and create some kind of uh, artificial intelligence that will help the uh, the folks that are just joining the new operators to be able to perform at the same level how can you let the um, the folks that have a lot more experience be able to uh, see behind the back of like the the new operators if they have an issue for example using like remote login technologies being able to remote remote monitoring technologies uh, ar vr technologies so those are some of the, um, the the some of the goals that we see from a digital transformation amongst many other things let me just go to the next slide here yep um, but there are challenges right so there are challenges which include um, high costs because obviously putting all these um, technologies in place comes with a cost and um, obviously that means that you have to have a realistic roi roi is the return of investment right so if you if i'm going to be investing say a million dollars in in sensors into uh, into all this other technology into robots and other technologies i i better be sure that i am i'm able to recoup it in 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 due time right um having some unrealistic rois on hey you know you install it and suddenly you'll you it'll be the best you'll get like millions of dollars that is sometimes a problem because it is only iot technologies are only as good or digital transformation uh, is only as good as like what you currently have and it really needs to be like a like a top down approach but basically management culture needs to change and it has to be a top down push to kind of transform companies right only then it will be something that is holistic and you look at uh, from an overall company perspective what needs to happen and then you'll have more realistic rois and then you can start tracking those things on are we achieving those things and then iot projects can actually see the light of the day and then scale um, across like uh, multiple factories multiple locations uh, which is uh, which is typically a challenge if you don't have realistic rois if you don't have the management buy in a lack of flexibility mainly coming from um, you know old if there is there's an analogy that is like a uh, typical in manufacturing where it's like if it's ain't broken don't fix it right so there is lack of flexibility among people that are there to adopt new technologies especially on the ot side of things and then you have it typically coming in with all these modern technologies that say hey you know let's do this let's do analytics let's do this the ot folks are like hold on, hold on wait a minute wait a minute i have um, i have my deadlines i have my goals i need to deliver stuff uh, and you don't know what i do right so i don't think it is appropriate for you to tell me that i need to do this because i don't see how that will impact me on how i'm going to deliver my stuff so i just want to continue to do what i do so there is a lack of flexibility in terms of um, in in terms of adopting these technologies and staffing issues like like i mentioned to you right you have folks that are retiring and the new folks coming in so obviously the expertise in the new near the new staff that's coming in is not as much and cybersecurity continues to be a, a big issue right the moment you talk about industry 4.0 the, the first thing that comes to mind is okay now you have to like i have to take the data out of my factory and put it in somewhere somewhere else but i don't have enough control and obviously there is always news about cyber attacks that happen in different industries uh, uh, from from various um, locations in the world if you will right it's become much easier to do that so it is it behooves us to ensure that as we put these automation technologies we keep improving our um, cyber security now can anybody rest and say that i have put in all the cyber security measures no right i mean that it is a journey it is a journey where you need to keep keep going and there is some amount of like uh, learning that needs to happen and then like it needs to keep improving i think technologies are there there's a lot of vendors that do it but a holistic approach to that is needed to solve the challenges of automation. So looking at the goals for modernization, right? Um, what are some of the goals that come based on like uh, the digital transformation goals or the goals for, or some of the challenges that automation is facing? So access to real-time data, that goes without saying, right? I mean, if I'm an oil and gas uh, company, right? My goal is that if, if I have remote uh, operations, say, let's say in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, um, in in some uh, some remote location, my goal is I want to be able to um, I want to be able to remotely manage that site or be able to see what is happening in that site to uh, to make sure that if I have to do something, if I have to send some personnel based on something that's going off, I can do that, right? 
I may not want to send people there because there are safety concerns with people going to those remote locations for a variety of reasons, right? So in, in that situation, having access to real-time data is absolutely key. So if you're not able to provide real-time data, then what happens is that you're making decisions based on data that's kind of dated and it's old, and that could actually le lead to a detrimental outcome, right? So that's absolutely important. Uh, digitizing equipment health inspection. So we have a lot of use cases where health inspections happen manually, right? The whole goal of like digital transformation, if I had to summarize, is like there's a lot of paperwork that still happens uh, in in factories, right? So if if all those things that happen manually, where people have to go around inspecting all the machines and then jotting things down, and then that goes into a sum file and that is that's lost. So you don't have like a paper trail of how those in, those machines were. Uh, the, the maintained and that kind of then leads to issues where you, you're not quite sure of the maintenance history and so you don't do maintenance at the right time for example and that leads to unplanned downtime so digitizing these health inspections and these um, maintenance records if you will will lead to ensuring that you have a good paper trail and so all these things can be automated and your machines can be up and running um, perfectly that will lead to minimization of the downtime Allowing modular uh, automation in, in a manufacturing plant, which is key because you have automation plants are uh, in different industries, process industries or continuous industries uh, have different uh, sections, if you will, where which maintain, which do different things. And ideally, they would want to kind of like have a modular approach where things can be brought in, things can be taken out, and uh, you want to be able to. And maybe some some sections are easily automatable. Other sections you need more human intervention. So having a view on how you how to do that, and having that trail, if you will, that is absolutely important. So that's a that's another major goal. Optimizing manufacturing process that goes without saying. That's a whole key of um, manufacturing because you want to kind of like self learn about your process, be more aware of how things are happening in your factory, and then be able to keep improving the manufacturing process, so like operational efficiency, which was obviously one of the big things that uh, you also came back with as uh, one of your main main concerns, use cases. Identifying bottlenecks, right? As you go through this, uh, typically you have human beings go around and trying to manually figure out like what the bottlenecks are. Now, obviously, when you have the experienced folks, they can easily spot it. But over time, what happens is like uh, you don't have that, that full, that uh, entire knowledge to be able to identify bottlenecks. So this is, again, um, there's something that if it can be automated, that's absolutely important. And then and enabling all of these things is like the digital traceability, right? Where you have a traceability of all your data that's happening over, like across your plant, right? Even now, even outside your plant, like in uh, pharma and other industries, supply chain disruptions have uh, caused a lot of issues. Like for example, um, drug shortages, because I'm not able to figure out how to manufacture this drug and how to work with uh, suppliers because hey, due to COVID or, or war situations, um, I'm not able to. Uh, I'm not able to get this uh, raw material that I need to build my my drug. Or in the the auto manufacturing industry, the chip shortage that happened because of uh, COVID, right? Everything got shut down, and so uh, all the suppliers could not supply the the chips that is needed for manufacturing vehicles. And I know now things have gotten better, but how to ensure that we learn from this experience and ensure that we have better view uh, globally on on supply chain data coming in so that manufacturing plants can be more efficient in terms of the raw materials coming in and uh, the finished goods going out. So those are the key goals from, uh, for modernization. So what are the challenges in terms of uh, data, right? So typically what happens is like you have a crisscross of connections, what we call a spaghetti connection on factory floor where you have different components here, gateway, uh, having a direct communication to an application or a device having a direct communication to an MEA system because that there is information that needs to be exchanged, right? And this is not efficient and it's not scalable because if you have all these spaghetti connections going on, not only it's, it, is it hard to figure out like which is connected to what, but it's also a bandwidth hogger, right? Because you have limited bandwidth and assuming that all this say that this communication happens over cellular or some, some infrastructure where which needs to be paid for, this is not an efficient. And plus like you don't have information to share all the time, right? So you're tying up an entire connection all the time for a communication that needs to happen, say once in a few days, right? That's not an efficient way to do it. And this is where we get a, what we call a unified uh, namespace. Um, that, that circle at the, the center, the gray circle, that is a, um, 
what we call a unified namespace where um, all the all the devices that need to communicate with each other are, are basically unifying their information into one location and that unified namespace could be a data broker an mqtt based data broker it could be other components but the idea is that you have a set of publishers uh, typically on the ot side of uh, your architecture that are publishing data when they're available and then you have uh, subscribers on the it side of the architecture that are subscribed to the data they have they are able to identify that that uh, that you using a topic name structure to say, hey, on this topic, I want if there is any information that's available from say a gateway or a PLC or a device, I need to be intimated. And that's what the broker or the unified namespace does, right? It lets them know so that they can get that information. So that it serves multiple purposes. One, it, it just makes the data flow so much more efficient. It's better efficient use of a bandwidth. And it helps a lot in like uh, low connectivity scenarios, right? Because you're able to manage the communication and you send only in the bursts of information that's needed as opposed to sending it all the time. And so that uh, introduces us to MQTT. Now MQTT is a, what we call a published subscribed based protocol. It's a message queuing protocol, right? It's not a, it's kind of like the, um, the way the, the, the information is exchanged on top of any transport layer, right? Which, which could be, Zigbee or wireless or LoRaWAN or LAN. So that is kind of like the, uh, the transport. And then this is the messaging layer that comes on top. That is uh, basically based on the publish subscribe based protocol where you have uh, faster and reliable data communication between um, devices, the publishers and the subscribers under constraint condition. The constraint might be network connectivity or bandwidth connect bandwidth issues, battery power and, and a lot of other, other uh, issues. It's based on TCP IP, so it's very robust. It is actually managed by a foundation named Eclipse Foundation, which um, has been managing it uh, for like the past 20 years or so. And um, and it's very ideal for an industry, uh, industrial in IoT because of the fact that it's uh, publish subscribe, it's low bandwidth, and it's uh, the message is uh, the message packet size is very small, so it's it is able to efficiently do the communication. So just quickly um, uh, introducing Sparkplug, which is another protocol that's based on top of MQTT. And let's, um, Sparkplug specifically addresses certain concerns uh, that the manufacturing industries have on top of MQTT. Now MQTT is, it's perfect for a lot of the use cases, but specifically in manufacturing, you have this concept of uh, subsystems, right? Where you have a SCADA system or you have like some subsystem that consists of like multiple devices, let's say, I have 20 devices on this line or 30 devices on this line. Uh, each of these individual devices don't need to publish, but the whole system needs to publish the data all at once, right? So there you have the concept of a data model where you have a data hierarchy of like, I'm in section one, line two, for example. That's kind of like a data model. And this is that is uh, solved by uh, the, the Sparkplug, which is a framework that allows, allows you to build a data model that enables your bidirectional communication between applications, uh, sensors, and gateways through this, uh, through this MQTT. So it basically is complementing MQTT sitting on top, and that's also managed by the Eclipse Foundation as well, which is, again, open source. So again, what, is, uh, what does Sparkplug do? It, uh, amongst many other things, it, it adds these additional functionality that makes it uh, very ideal for manufacturing use cases. Like if you have a subsystem, uh, you can manage the state of that subsystem. I'm, I'm, I'm born, right? So then anybody that is subscribed to that will know that a new subsystem, subsystem is born. Whereas I'm dead, meaning like I've been taken down. Everybody is, gets to know that that subsystem is gone. So they know that they need to kind of uh, change something based on that. And it also um, adds the data model as we talked about. So this is kind of like the overall architecture based on everything coming together uh, in terms of our architecture. Um, I think we've kind of covered some of these details. Uh, I'll be, and this is kind of like how things will look in a multi-vendor scenario because, uh, you know, obviously when it comes to industrial IoT, you cannot have one vendor do everything, right? So you have your your uh, sensor manufacturers, you have your gate, gateway manufacturers, you have your networking network providers, then you have your data consolidators, right? Uh, your PLCs, you have controllers, and then you have that kind of like predominantly sits on your OT side of things. And then you have the data consolidators, the unified namespace providers like HiveMQ uh, brokers that is able to consolidate this information and send it into your IT side of the equation and then enable bi bi-directional communication. This is how it kind of looks. 
Okay, I at this moment I would like to pass it over to Kudzai to talk about um, how what five ways uh, MQTT Spark Plug enables smart manufacturing. So over to you, Kudzai. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Ravi. Okay, so uh, I think uh, Ravi has uh, laid a, a great foundation for us here uh, in terms of the application of MQTT and Spark Plug uh, in smart manufacturing. So now let's kind of like drill down into uh, the, the the ways in which it actually enables uh, smart manufacturing. So if you could uh, move over to the next slide, Ravi. Right, so the first um, item that I would like us to discuss here is uh, real-time uh, data sharing. Right? So what we, do we mean by that? So now this idea uh, that Ravi has already alluded to, that uh, with a, a MQTT Spark plug, right, within a network, essentially what you're doing is you're creating a central hub or a central repository of information whereby every participant uh, in a factory, in a plant floor, pushes data to that single uh, unified namespace. Every uh, protocol uh, that is being used, if it's, if it's uh, IIoT, it's, it's able to communicate uh, to the centralized broker or the centralized hub. And then if it happens that there is a device or a system that is not so smart and it does not communicate using IoT protocols, then you'd have those gateways that you saw from the previous uh, diagram that Ravi shared, right? So, but essentially the idea is that every element, every component publishes to that centralized uh, hub or central server where that information is then available uh, to every other participant. Now, this is real-time information because essentially when you, when you build a unified namespace, what you do is uh, within your broker, because the MQTT, uh, as a technology, it allows you to create uh, uh, hierarchies using what are called topics, right? So it, you can have a topic structure that allows you to create hierarchies where your data is going to live. So what you can then do using uh, that ability is that you can then start to organize your business or organization around that topic structure. You can create your enterprise and then inside your enterprise, you can then create some sub hierarchies according to all the different business functions. Now, each component that is in the factory will then send data into a location or hierarchy where it makes sense for that data to live. So for example, if you want to uh, send information from an MES system uh, to a, a system in a production line so that the system knows instantly what is the current overall equipment effectiveness, right? So that line can be adjusted based on that information that is coming uh, from the MES system. And so if all of that information is being unified in that one central uh, place uh, in real time, it gives uh, all the other components the power to be able to make decisions based on the knowledge of what's happening on the other side uh, of, the, uh, of the plant and also coming from the enterprise side of things. So this, in a way, it enables the key uh, elements that are required really to, to kind of like uh, transition into smart manufacturing, which is uh, also, as, as you uh, uh, rightly pointed out, one of the biggest uh, uh, benefits or one of the biggest objectives with uh, uh, smart manufacturing is to improve of efficiency. And that efficiency can only be improved by access to real-time information, without which it's really hard to be efficient because you don't know when to act. You can only act after, after the fact, when at the, at the end of the day, uh, you can look at reports and see what went wrong, and then you try to uh, uh, do better tomorrow, but it doesn't let you improve efficiency in real time as that data is generated. So as you can see, Sparklot actually brings all of that information uh, into that central location for you to be able to make decisions quickly and uh, also um, uh, change the cost of the, uh, production and that also uh, kind of speaks to product quality, right? So if a product is going bad, you want to know instantly. So if there's something that is actually affecting the quality of your product, you don't want to find out at the end of the shift or at the end uh, of the day to see, okay, here we had a problem that was causing this issue. You want to be able to find out instantly. And there's so many issues that could be happening in a plant floor that could cause your product to actually go bad. It could be that there's a faulty piece of equipment 
it could be that the, the recipe in itself is wrong or all these kind of things that you can that need to be able to determine instantly and then be able to take action. So if all of these things are applied consistently, it really helps you to kind of transition into uh, smart manufacturing. And the other issue really here to point out, which is really at the core of smart manufacturing is being able to produce a, a batch size of one, right? Because the, the biggest uh, 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 opportunity really for manufacturers is to be able to address the needs of a single uh, customer, right? And currently it's really hard. You've got to like really use like batches to address the needs of multiple customers. But with smart manufacturing, the ability to have data being shared instantly, it allows you to customize your production systems in such a way that it enables you to uh, produce a batch size of one and be able to uh, get customer requirements and be able to actually deliver for each uh, specific uh, customer. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, Ravi, please. So the other key aspect really uh, when it comes to enabling uh, smart manufacturing is uh, improved uh, collaboration. Now, the biggest challenge with uh, IT, OT integration is this fact that when you move data from your plant floor or for, for, from your OT environment into uh, IT, uh, it's, it somehow loses uh, integrity because it has to go through multiple hops, right? Like, for example, it goes into your scanner system, it goes into your MES, ERP, and so on and so forth. And you are not empowered to make decisions based on that data because uh, what you could, the data that you could be looking at could be data that is like stale, right? It's, it's, it's not the current state of your business, right? So it's really hard to, to organize your business around that data because that data is not, there isn't much integrity to that data. So with, again, SparkPlug, this idea that you can actually create a single source of truth, whereby if you connect to a central hub and start to receive information, you can be rest assured that that information that you're actually receiving right now is the current state of your entire business. And you can then go on to confidently uh, uh, build your business processes around that because you know that at any given moment, you're getting actual information that is uh, uh, coming from your uh, your plant or from your organization. And then this sort of like improves uh, the, the collaboration because uh, the systems are then able to actually share information and then be able to solve problems in real time, in real time, because they have got access to a single source of truth. Uh, and, and, and then they're able to actually uh, improve the processes uh, that are, are really essential for your business to transition to uh, smart manufacturing. So at the core, this really uh, allows you to be innovative as a company uh, to use data to actually innovate right as a company which is really uh, what uh, uh, we, we, we desire out of this uh, smart manufacturing uh, initiatives so if you could move to the next one now the next uh, uh, topic here that we want to talk about is uh, the idea that uh, MQTT spark plug uh, enables um, uh, the elimination of custom uh, programming Right, so basically, first of all, to kind of describe what that means is that with MQTT Spark Plug, you don't need to uh, develop custom scripts, right? Because with traditional uh, uh, approaches in the industry, if you want to get data from, like you say, a PLC system, uh, you've got to have a way of writing a custom script that will enable you to uh, collect data from that. Uh, a system that has got all of that information and then be able to publish it to the cloud where you are then able to um, apply some advanced analytics. Now with Spark Plug, what you do instead is that you use tools that allow you to just uh, configure your systems and just drag some tags and then point them to be, to, to be published to that centralized uh, location. There's no need for you to do some custom scripting and that's really important as far as enabling uh, smart manufacturing is concerned because one of the biggest challenges when it comes to uh, manufacturing is the ability to um, attract talent because uh, smart manufacturing really shifts the, uh, the, the game to that of being able to uh, uh, deploy and implement software systems. And as you would know, uh, manufacturers are not really well known for being uh, good with software systems and it's mostly uh, industrial electrical system that they play around with. And if you're uh, programming PLCs, 
it's just literally uh, knowledge uh, that comes from your electrical uh, engineering background. But for you to be able to compete in an environment that requires you to build software, it means you have got to uh, attract talent and talent is expensive. So obviously, if you're not able to get the right people to be able to write the custom script like Python and stuff like that, then it means you, you, you can actually benefit from getting the tools that really abstract all of that implementation for you. All you need to do is just to be able to uh, know what, what data you want uh, and, and, and how to get it. So which is what an automation engineer will be able to do because an automation engineer knows precisely I need to get temperature from that boiler. I need to get so and so. So all they need to do is just to use that interface and point to the text that they need to uh, get and then publish those tags up to the um, to the cloud or to the MQTT broker that centralized UNS system, right? And it, it, the other issue really here that uh, is uh, important as far as eliminating custom programming is concerned is the idea that it addresses tight coupling, right? So you might have resources to actually build those software scripts, those custom scripts, but eventually you end up with a technical debt because you are building custom scripts that eventually will need to be uh, removed or they will actually become an obstacle uh, at the end of the day where you now need to integrate more and more because that knowledge is only specific to that particular uh, custom script. And moreover, this kind of like really introduces a complexity of your system. So for example, if you're using a certain custom script for, to get data from one system, you're using a certain custom script to get uh, data from another PLC system, it really it increases the complexity of your uh, uh, industrial IoT or smart manufacturing initiatives, which kind of really makes it difficult for you to uh, achieve uh, results with that, right? And also to add on to that, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, reasons why uh, smart manufacturing or digital transformation initi initiatives fail is, is, is this idea that is a, a lot of um, organizations go into it uh, expecting to get value right away, right? Uh, they don't want to like wait for years and years until they start to derive value out of that. And if you have to kind of like build custom systems, that's basically what you're going to end up doing, just dragging on and on and on because you're trying to, 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 to integrate systems and you're, you're, you're trying to take care of all of that heavy lifting yourself, right? With Spark Plug, the idea is that you're reducing the time to value because the moment that you install a Spark Plug system or a Spark Plug network, it's literally just a matter of pointing to your data and then pointing to the broker at the end and then your data starts flowing. Now it just only depends on you being able to apply the right uh, analytics tools and system to be able to then derive value out of uh, that data. And also there is um, reduction in risk, right? As you would know, um, managing a project or any software project uh, involve a lot of risk right so you don't want to really uh, have that also as something that you need to to worry about when you're actually uh, uh, embarking on a smart manufacturing initiative you want to be able to actually avoid all of the risk so having or using a standardized platform of uh, connectivity will help uh, towards uh, uh, that so if you go to the next slide Ravi. yes so um, scalability and uh, real reliability. So uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, so you, um, uh, uh, on our poll, uh, I think we got like the most uh, people are mentioning the idea of integration and scalability being, being the, uh, the biggest challenge, which uh, really resonates a lot with uh, what we've been seeing, because uh, this is one of the core uh, challenges or the one of the core principles really of MQTT and Spark Plug as a whole. This idea to, 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 to enable scalability because I'll give you an example. Suppose you, uh, you've got data out of a, a system. So this could be like a scatter system that you want to be able to expose to other components that are interested in that uh, data. Now, if you have, uh, let's say 10, 15 or 20 other systems within your plant flow, that are inter interested in that data, it's probably uh, but good enough because the SCADA system is, is, is capable of handling those requests, 15 to 20 requests. But you'd imagine a, a situation whereby with digital transformation of smart manufacturing, the, 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 the components that are interested in a, in a certain uh, piece of information, they scale quite quickly, right? It could scale to thousands, tens of thousands, or even 
for some uh, uh, scenarios to millions, right? So you would imagine whether you've got a single system that needs to serve uh, the request of 10,000 uh, other systems that need data from it. So it quickly becomes really difficult for that information for that information source to be able to handle that. So this is where what we call really the 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 the, the, the failure to scale, right? Like the failure to adapt to the load. As the load increases, you want to be able to also elastic, elastically increase so that you can serve interest regardless of the number of connections that are actually requesting that information. So because uh, with MPTT Spark Plug, the way that that information source handles requests is not dependent on the number of connections because all of the information is handled by the broker. The broker is the one that coordinates. So if your broker is, uh, is, is actually uh, deployed in an environment that allows it to scale elastically, as what we actually uh, provide uh, as far as I'm, IFMQ is concerned, uh, where we actually provide a, a situation whereby you're able to use um, clustering technology, whereby your broker also doesn't become a single point of failure. Uh, they, you, we can actually deploy multiple brokers, but also just expose one endpoint, whereby every other system is just looking at that one endpoint, but behind the system, uh, there's like multiple brokers that are handling all of that information and making sure that regardless or irrespective of the number of connections that are actually connecting and requesting information, it doesn't fall, it doesn't affect how that source of information handles that. And this also speak, speaks to the uh, issue of uh, reliability, right? Because you also want to be in a situation whereby your system is reliable and you don't want to uh, uh, lose any information. And HiveMQ was really born out of the uh, connect connected car space where just losing, for example, if you are in a situation whereby you are, you are, you are trying to diagnose a, a vehicle, right, in an assembly line, you want to see if this vehicle meets the quality test, right? You don't want to lose any piece of information in such a scenario. You want to always be 100% guaranteed that information is going to be uh, put into your database so that when you then need to actually produce some reports to show that all your vehicles, when they went out uh, there, they actually met the spec. So that can only be uh, achieved by using an architecture that allows you to actually build that centralized uh, uh, hub of information that is able to, to, to actually scale and actually create some clusters that make sure if one broker falls, there's uh, five or six more brokers that can actually take care of that message and make sure that it actually gets delivered where it is intended to go. So this really is a, a, an important aspect of, of smart manufacturing because it gives you the freedom to keep on adding components and adding functionality and adding sensors, retrofitting everywhere without having to worry about whether your system is going to be able to handle that load. Yeah. Right. And, uh, the last point that I want to talk about here is really uh, around data management, right? So if uh, there's some of you uh, on this call here who are familiar with the PLC systems uh, or industrial system for that matter, you'd, uh, you'd know that uh, there isn't really a, a data model. Most of the information is just available as a tag value. So if it's temperature, there's a temperature and then there is a value. Now, that information might be useful if you're just like sending it to a scatter system because you've got drawings that shows you precisely this is the temperature for such and such a pump, this is the temperature for such and such a boiler and stuff like that. That's useful within a, a factory system. But as soon as you leave the factory, you go into an analytic system, that information is not that useful because it just says temperature. Like, okay, so but what do you do with that temperature information? How, how, how can you make sense out of that? Because there's no context to it, right? So spark plug uh, adds on top of that uh, metadata right which allows you to actually add properties to your uh, to, to your metrics so if you are retrieving information from plcs from scatter systems and publishing it to, to the broker which then forwards it to the data analytics systems it it it, it, it uh, enriches that uh, information that data to include the context because it's just got what is called a properties which allow you to put things like your your, your, your units, your, 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 your hierarchical structure, if that piece of information is actually behind another PLC, maybe it's just like a, a remote terminal unit that is behind another major PLC, you can actually reflect all of that within your spark plug metric 
to actually enrich your information such that when that information lands in a database, uh, if, if an IT person who's not really familiar with industrial systems is looking at that information, they're able to actually make sense out of it. Even not just only human, even computer systems are able to actually make sense out of that because there is context uh, behind that uh, uh, piece of data. And Sparklight actually takes it a, a step further, right? Because that addresses the issue of uh, interoperability, whereby you are moving data into a server that that is the data that is known to be like a, 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 an integer or a float if it's temperature but there's a need to take it a step further by actually defining a model right so for example if i'm dealing with a boiler i could send information to say okay this is the temperature and these are the uh, uh, units of measurement and this is coming from a boiler but I could actually get more sense out of it if I send all of that information as being an object that represents an entire an entire boiler as a, that represents that boiler in its entirety, right? And that would allow you to make more sense and to be able to actually build systems that allow you to even simulate what's going to happen to the pressure if I change the temperature. So how Sparkplug enables that is that it has got a, a concept of template. So you're able to actually define some custom objects, right? So within your factory, if you have got like a thousand uh, air, air compressors, you can actually define that type of a compressor within your uh, uh, your Sparkplug network and then create instances of those uh, compressors and then just push them to the cloud where you then uh, be able to uh, do things like your digital twins because essentially that's the concept of a digital twin whereby you're able to just create one model and then be able to instance uh, to, to create instances of that same model and be able to reflect that in the cloud and do uh, things like uh, simulation and, and stuff like that. And the nice thing about this is that you don't need to implement those templates uh, uh, manually. So again, it goes back to the uh, principle of eliminating custom programming because there are tools, for example, within uh, an ignition platform, uh, you're able to create, uh, to use uh, user-defined types. So if you're using user-defined types to create your objects, uh, the MQTT transmission module is able to read that and interpret it and then convert it to MQTT Sparkplug automatically. So all you need to do is just use the systems that you're already familiar with to create those objects and then all of that information to convert it into a Sparkplug object is taken care of uh, under the hood. And then the, the, the big, big disadvantage really, uh, the advantage rather uh, as far as that is concerned is that this directly integrates with uh, uh, platforms like Azure Digital Twins, right, which allow you to actually uh, directly create uh, objects and be able to reflect them within Azure Digital Twins platform. And you can also do the same within AWS IoT SiteWise. So once your data lands in AWS IoT SiteWise or Azure Digital Twins, the, 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 the possibilities there are endless of what you can do with that data because Azure provides a lot of data services and tools for you to be able to dig into that uh, information and be able to make sense out of that, which is uh, really crucial as far as uh, being uh, successful with smart manufacturing is concerned. Okay, if you could uh, move to the awesome. next slide. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I think maybe here, Ravi would uh, be able to actually uh, 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 explain uh, our, the Sparkplug compatibility program that we uh, actually a part of. So Ravi, over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just uh, I know in the interest of time, we just wanted to quickly uh, talk about the Hive MQ platform in general. Obviously, like all the benefits that we presented are general MQTT Sparkplug, and we are we are 100% MQTT compliant. We are 100% Sparkplug compliant, and that's that's kind of like the Sparkplug compatibility program that the Eclipse Foundation recently launched, where they said as of the 3.0, people need to kind of like be able to test their compliance or um, compatibility with with Sparkplug. And there is a specific procedure using a, a particular tool that will actually ensure that they're 100% com compliant. And then if they're compliant, you get this like logo that you can use, right? Um, and so we were the first ones to get that because obviously we are kind of like, we have been part of the Sparkplug community from day one. And in fact, our tools are actually used for some of these compliance testing. So we actually created those tools that are used by other vendors to test their compatibility against the program. So obviously we drank our own Kool-Aid and became the first one to be compatible. And just kind of like bringing all the points that uh, Kudzai mentioned together where 
we obviously are 100% based on MQTT and Sparkplug, and we added our own feature functionality. We started in the connected car space where we can, we are highly um, scalable. We can scale up to 200 million connections. We recently launched a white paper uh, uh, regarding like regarding that and uh, we are our, our own testing there. Happy to share that with you. Uh, we are highly uh, reliable where we ensure that uh, like a availability perspective, right? If one cluster goes down, we can ensure that also another cluster comes up immediately. So from a downtime perspective, from a reliability perspective, it's right there. Observability is something key for us where like um, IoT systems are complex. You want to make sure that whenever like there is loss of data right we talked about real time data if you are not able to see real time data you want to go back and start debugging it quickly and you need the tools to be able to debug we provide that we provide a control center command center and we also provide plugins to like external systems uh, where you can also start viewing some of these dashboards so you you identify problems quickly and security is absolutely key because that's kind of like the bedrock of uh, what we do and uh, extensions framework that's something that we briefly touched upon where we believe in kind of democracy of data, right? Where we don't want to lock in customers into one platform, be it Azure or AWS or Google platform, right? We believe that like customers would want to go to various cloud platforms or on-premise platforms based on their use case. And we are a commercial enterprise grade commercial broker that allows all of this communication to happen. And we use extension frameworks to do that. For example, we have an extension for Azure. We have one for AWS. Uh, we have one for Google PubSub. And we have one for Kafka, which is again a streaming platform. We have a um, bridge extension, which allows uh, you to bridge your uh, brokers from one factory to the enterprise. So it makes the data communication easy. We have one for uh, enterprise security so that like IT professionals can imp implement whatever security protocols they have within their IT, IT uh, infrastructure on the broker. So that's uh, that's kind of what we wanted to uh, discuss. I know we are a little over time. We apologize, we just got excited with all the with all the information that we had to share with you so we'll obviously share a lot of the the, the, slide, the deck will be available to you and uh, we'll obviously make all these uh, other content available as well so at this point why don't i uh, send it back to jack for any questions that you can help us uh, answer thank you ravi and kudzai for a great presentation and now it is time for questions and we have some that have already come in but as a reminder, use the questions tab on your screen to submit your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. And those that we don't get to will be responded to by way of email uh, by our speakers. So, thank you. Um, first one I'm going to send to you, Robbie. Um, <clears throat> we use Azure infrastructure. Can we host Hive MQ on Azure? I think you touched on this. Can you elaborate? Yes, 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 absolutely. So uh, HiveMQ is a very flexible broker where you can install HiveMQ on premise, right? On bad metal, you can install it on a Kubernetes cluster. You can install it on Redshift, or you can install it on the cloud. It it all depends on the customer use cases. Uh, a lot of customers want to use their already available cloud infrastructure to host HiveMQ. They can absolutely do that. And um, again, through our bridge extension, for example, right? We can have a instance of HiveMQ, which is sitting on premise, be able to talk to an enterprise HiveMQ that's sitting on, on a customer's um, Azure instance or AWS instance, right? So that makes the communication easy. So absolutely for a factory scenario, that uh, that, is, uh, that is a very viable option. And we also do offer a, what we call a SaaS offering, which is software as a service, a managed service offering, where we can manage a cloud instance, um, bring it up ourselves and manage HiveMQ on a customer's behalf. So they don't have to do that. That's also an option, depending on what customers want to do. Jack. Thank you. That's a good a good answer. Could I now uh, you get the next question? Do we need an MQTT five to implement MQTT Spark plug? Yeah. So the short answer the is uh, no. You don't need MQTT five to implement MQTT Spark plug. Uh, according to MQTT Spark Plug specification, you need at least MQTT 3.1.1. So that would include both MQTT 3.3.1 and MQTT 5. So MQTT 5 is not mandatory, but MQTT Spark Plug works on MQTT 5, but it's not mandatory. You need at least 3.1.1.1. Thank you. Ravi, you get this question. 
what are the advantages of using MQTT over UP OPC UA? Both architectures look similar. Yeah, and that's a question we we get a lot, uh, get a lot, right? Um, so in a in a world where um, you know we can absolutely work together with OPC UA, absolutely, right? I mean, to me, the way I look at it uh, is OPC UA is a framework, a foundation. It is more compatible, I would say, with Spark Plug, right? Because the, both are kind of frameworks that have like some models on how you can define your data. It is absolutely the number one when it uh, framework when it comes to machine to machine communication, right? Where they have kind of simplified, unified a lot of the architecture to be able to do that, right? MQTT provides actually the the transport layer, the messaging layer on top, right? You you can do OPC UA say over MQTT, you can do it over UDP, you can do it over other other ways. Now, MQTT is becoming more and more prevalent when it comes to uh, getting the data out of your machines or your on premise to an enterprise or from a on premise to a cloud because of all the advantages that we we talked about. Sparkplug is also getting a lot of popularity because of how uh, lean it is and how it's able to add in the additional data modeling capabilities. Kudzai, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, I think you you perfectly you perfectly captured it there. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, over well, to you, Jack. I'll, oh, I will give Kudzai this question. Uh, can I use Sparkplug to create a unified namespace? And I think you touched on that a little bit too. Yes, yes, yes. So we've already touched uh, a little bit on that. So yeah, basically the, the answer there is yes, you can use Sparkplug to uh, create a unified namespace. While there might be uh, other protocols that you can use, um, the, 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 the advantage of using Sparkplug is this idea of uh, being able to meet the minimum technical requirement, right? Which is that it's an open technology, uh, it's report by exception, uh, it's lightweight, mm -hmm. and uh, also it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it, it easily integrates with the, with the, with the, with the rest of the uh, uh, infrastructure or the rest of the, of, of, of the components. So Sparkplug has got that uh, advantage over other technologies that you could use to implement uh, uh, a unified namespace. Right, and and if you are a, if I can just add to that, right? So if you are already using an MQTT solution, if you will, right? I think it behooves you to use Sparkplug because Sparkplug is kind of like built on top of MQTT, so you're already there, so seventy percent of the way, and it's easier for you to implement the thirty percent as opposed to trying to do your own way of doing it. Now there is obviously multiple ways to do it, but uh, there is obvious advantages to using Sparkplug with MQTT because how how they're intertwined. Okay, Robbie, you get this yeah. next question. Uh, we have network connectivity issues in our manufacturing unit. Would MQTT Sparkplug work where network connectivity is feeble? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, that is the whole bedrock of why MQTT was created in the first place. Um, just, just giving a little history on MQTT. MQTT was actually invented by two people from IBM, Andrew Stanford Clark and um, and uh, uh, another gentleman from IBM in, uh, in uh, the late 90s um, to address the concerns of a customer. Uh, Philips 66 was the customer, uh, called Conoco Philips, one of the two, um, where they, they wanted to be able to connect to the remote um, operations like uh, oil pipelines, which is kind of like in the middle of nowhere with absolutely zero connectivity or very less connectivity or the connectivity is very costly for them, right? So they had bandwidth limitations, they had connect connectivity limitations, safety concerns for being able to send people there to be able to do stuff. So they wanted to do remote ma management, right, of their operations. So MQTT was specifically created uh, for that purpose uh, with the publish subscribe, which allows you to publish when the data is available. And the, the packet size was specifically made like small so that like it, it is able to work with low connectivity scenarios where you can send it in short bursts whenever connectivity is available. Um, with Sparkplug, for example, there are store and forward capabilities where for whatever reason, if the connectivity is lost, you can kind of like buffer the data and you can forward it when the data connectivity is restored, right? So all of these things are specifically added to Sparkplug and MQTT to address some of these low connectivity, low bandwidth, hostile environments, if you will. It looks like uh, we have time for one more question and I'm gonna direct it to both of you. Um, so is the hub 
a data lake or an edge connection device, uh, like a router of sorts. Could Zai, would you okay, like to take that take... first? Yeah, sure. So the hub, uh, first of all, it's not, a, it's not a data lake, right? It's not a, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a store because a data, a data lake typically is where you go to like dump uh, data, 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 and then go on to kind of try to make sense out of that data after some time. So the hub is like a, a source of real time data as it stands that hub is, is what holds that information. Uh, like it's, it's a snapshot, basically. It's a snapshot of your business and enterprise at any given moment. It's not a data lake where there's massive amount of data from ye years back or months back. It's like a snapshot of the current state of your business. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, just to second what uh, Kudzai says, so, so our goal is not to create yet another data lake. Our goal and our purpose of where we are as a company is to enable data movement, bi-directional data movement to support all your advanced manufacturing use cases or other use cases within industrial applications, right? And we do that the best and we want to go deep on that. So we don't do anything with the data currently. We just pass the data, but we ensure that the real-time data is available to you either on premise or on the cloud or in other applications that then take it and do whatever it, they need to do to be able to do whatever they do. Thank you. It looks like we're out of time. And thanks again, Ravi and Kudzai for an excellent presentation. Is there anything Thank you, you would like to say to conclude? Yeah, all I would like to say is uh, it's been a great session. Thank you, automation.com for pro providing this opportunity to us to be able to talk about MQTT Spark plug, which is a uh, very uh, like fast moving, fast growing kind of uh, way to support IIoT, like where like um, you know information sharing is absolutely key to enable all the advanced use cases that are coming up, like digital twins and additive manufacturing and all the new technologies. So we are very excited about where we are and uh, happy to share some nuggets of information with uh, with the audience. And thank you, Jack, for wonderfully coordinating the session for us. Really appreciate that. Thanks again, uh, Ravi and Kudzai, and I want to thank our attendees for being here today. And I remind our listeners that if you missed any portion of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, the presentation, including the Q&A, will be available on demand. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive an email with a link to the recording. You will also receive a post-webinar survey, and please take a moment to respond to it because we can use this information to Im continually improve your experience. On behalf of automation.com and HiveMQ, I thank you for your attention. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you.